So AI is everywhere. We're using it every day, even when we don't realize it. When Google Maps is finding a route, when Facebook is suggesting a friend, when an ad is being served to you. We don't understand how AI works fundamentally. So this project has been with DeepMind, which is an AI lab based in the UK. And they're very well known for their work on AlphaGo. They've written the most successful Go playing game, chess playing game. They can play better than any human at Atari. And then recently they became very well known for work on protein folding, which is a fundamental question in biology. Given a DNA string, how does the corresponding protein form? And these are basic questions for humanity. And I think that AI and machine learning can be a tremendous force for good for humans. And that's one of the reasons that I was involved in this project. What we did was train models to predict quantities of importance for us pure mathematicians. Very difficult, abstract problems. And then we tried to look at the model and decide what's actually going on. What is the computer picking up on? And it's a little bit like you have some colleague who is very smart but can't explain to you how they're getting the answer right every time. So we've worked very hard to try to use basic techniques to reverse engineer the machine learning and then learn things that we humans can understand. So I view this as like a small piece in the problem of explainability of AI. So often in mathematics, we deal in very, very high dimensional spaces, like 248 dimensions or something, some enormous space. And we try to use the intuition that we have from two and three and maybe four dimensions to explore these high dimensional spaces. But our intuition is fundamentally limited. And sometimes if we use machine learning or AI models, we can explore aspects of those spaces or see relationships which aren't obvious to us. So the two tasks that machine learning tends to do really well on are image recognition and speech recognition. These are tasks that were totally beyond computer scientists 20 years ago. So imagine that I've got a model that can tell me with incredibly high accuracy if a picture contains a cat. But it can't tell me how. What I can do to this model is I can start messing with the picture. I mess with it a little bit, and then it says it's still a cat. And then I mess with it a little bit more, it says it's still a cat. And then I mess with it a little bit more, and it says no, it's not a cat anymore. Then you can start saying, ah, aha, this is the thing that you're zooming into model, this is the catness in this picture. And that's what we've done in these high dimensional models in mathematics to gain human understanding out of a machine learning model. So what's a neural net? Basically what we did is we looked at how the brain works. So a brain has a whole lot of neurons and they fire and they're connected together in some complicated way. And we built a very crude model of that on a computer. And then what we do is we try to adjust the firing rates so that this neural net performs some task, for example, recognizing a cat in a photo. And for some reason this works and we don't really know why. So how do we train a neural net? It's a little bit like navigating a landscape. So what we want to do is we're in a landscape, it's very foggy, we can't see the mountains, and we're trying to find the top of mountains. And what we do is we just kind of wander around the landscape and try and basically go uphill. And for some reason, even though this landscape is very rocky and very mountainous, these algorithms tend to find peaks, i.e. peaks of performance. So this might come as a surprise to many, but mathematicians are deeply intuitive people. I'm an absolutely hopeless surfer, but if I surf with really good surfers, they can tell me, you should sit here in the wave. And if I ask them, why should I be here, they can't tell you. It's some kind of feeling. And mathematicians are very similar. We often operate on intuitions about a problem. What could lead to a solution? And often we'll work for many months without reliable evidence to go on. So when we find one of these peaks, this means that our algorithm is doing well. So AI has been incredibly successful in human application, like image recognition and speech recognition, but mathematicians have been very suspicious of its utility attacking difficult mathematics problems. And I think that this work shows that certainly AI is nowhere near replacing mathematicians, but it's an incredibly useful tool 
a little bit like a pocket calculator, which I think that we should start embracing. So in this project, we concentrated on two areas of mathematics, knot theory and representation theory. And in knot theory, what you have is a knot as you would think of a knot. And you can associate a whole lot of different measures of this knot. So there's hundreds of different measures of this knot's complexity. And we know a lot of relationships between these measures, but what we thought is maybe there are some unnoticed relationships that AI can help us discover. And indeed it did. So what we worked on in representation theory is called the combinatorial invariance conjecture. This is a, about a 40 year old conjecture. It was first put forward by George Lustig in 1981, 1982. And what is going on here is you have some very complicated structure and to this structure you associate a polynomial. So this complex structure is called a Bruhar interval and the polynomial is called the kajdan lutzig polynomial. And the conjecture is saying that this polynomial only depends on the structure. And what happened when we trained this model is the model could get basically 100% on this problem. And so we knew that the answer is there somewhere and the really difficult part of this project was to reverse engineer the model to gain understanding about this problem. And what we ended up coming up with by directly looking at this model is a conjecture for how to get this polynomial out, which we checked in over a million examples. And I think that we're very close to a proof of this conjecture. So this is one of the first times an AI model has led to a mathematical theorem. So in mathematics, we have theorems and theorems have proofs. And often we can check something in millions and millions of examples on a computer. And if it's true in all those examples, it doesn't mean the theorem is true. It still could be the case that in some crazy example, very, very far away off in the universe, that statement is false. So this is the way that computers have traditionally been used in mathematics to check conjectures. What we've been doing in this project is different We've been asking machine learning to suggest to us the aspects of a problem that might be relevant for its solution. And so it's using computers to generate conjectures in a way that hasn't been done before. It's still up to us though to finally find the proof and that's what I'm still struggling with now. So what I find really funny is that AI at its very base basis is incredibly simple. It's just a whole lot of matrices plus maybe a max function. And so this subject that I thought was so boring in first year linear algebra, these massive matrices of numbers that I couldn't care less about, actually turns out to be this incredibly powerful thing. I mean, 100 years ago, we thought about intelligence as being a single variable, IQ. And now we know that this is not the case, that there's many different kind of axes of intelligence. You can have emotional intelligence or social intelligence or intellectual intelligence. And I view AI as basically being another axis. And so it's not going to replace our intelligence, it's going to augment it. And I think that we can come to very interesting new understanding of the world by looking along this new axis.